Uh, thank you so much for your kind words of welcome. I'm really excited to be here in the Basque country and, and, and to see uh, what kind of uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic environment you have here. And, and also I was surprised when I saw, saw this, this opportunity for bio, bioeconomy and looking at your forests, forests here. So our, our mindset in Finland or in the northern part of uh, Europe is that, yeah, that so this part of your... Europe is dry and, uh, and you don't have that much forests and uh, opportunities for for uh, economies like uh, in the northern Europe are, are not uh, are, are limited but but I have to change my change my mind when I have seen seen this fantastic uh, fantastic place um, you don't play ice hockey we do um, this story can be easily translated into into uh, uh, football as well so that uh, you can take whatsoever uh, football star to compensate the name I'm going to use. I'm, I'm going to use uh, Wayne Kretzky. He, he's probably the best ever ice hockey player, uh, a Canadian uh, who is still active in ice, ice hockey uh, world. Um, he was once asked, what is the difference between a good player and a star? And uh, Mr. Kretzky is not a philosopher, but I think that his answer is philosophical. He said, a good player is skating where the puck is, but the star is skating where the puck is going to go. And think about uh, football as well. If you want to make a goal, don't run where the ball is, but you have to run where the ball is going to go. And this is the, the fundamental part of my story. I'm not going to speak what's going on, but I'm trying to illustrate what is going to happen and how we should be able to prepare for the future in order to get maximum benefit from, from that. And I think this is fundamental for Europe in today's circumstances. If we want to get out of this uh, crisis, whatever crisis we have, uh, financial crisis, economic crisis, banking crisis, uh, uh, employment crisis, and so on, even, even political crisis, I think the only way to get out of this crisis is to create something new, something that is going to unite Europeans for the, for the future. And uh, I personally believe that uh, those factors that are really creating the future are not institutional or constitutional or, or political or ideological, but they are very much linked to, to our economy, our technological capacities, our skills and talents, uh, because, because these are capacities on the, on the basis of which uh, the future of European competitiveness can be created. And if Europe is competitive, we can be social, we can be environmental friendly, we can achieve all the social aspect, objectives we have set. But if we are not doing well, if we are not competitive, the fact is that it's very difficult to achieve these, these uh, important social, uh, environmental and other objectives as, as well. Somebody already mentioned uh, the word or the concept paradigm shift. I, th I think we have, we have going to face a dramatic paradigm shift, and there are many reasons for for that. But the first, of all, first of all, I'd like to take an example what paradigm shift has meant in another sector, not in a bio sector, but in ICT sector, which is very close to to us in in, in Finland. And I was, I was uh, in both in politics and business closely linked to that process. So I'm speaking about a process that I know quite well. Um, one paradigm was uh, e expressed by the Club of Rome. You remember the Club of Rome that presented its report in 1972. That was the first, uh, first major sustainability report in the world. And it was waking up call for all of us to understand that there are limits for growth, and we have to be able to, to, to understand those limits. Uh, in that report, uh, the, the, the oil issue, uh, other resource issues were, uh, were uh, getting a lot of attention, but one minor message, uh, and actually not that minor, but one message that was not that well taken in uh, early 1970s was the prediction the Club of Rome made 
about uh, telecommunication uh, market. And uh, the Gulf of Rome expected that Indians and Chinese will never be able to, to connect into the global telecommunication network because of uh, one practical reason. Can you imagine what was the explanation? The limitation was lack of copper. They said that millions of uh, Chinese and Indians will not be able to be connected because there is not enough copper to create fixed line connections for that kind of huge number of people. But that concept on that paradigm changed in a massive way in 1980s and 1990s when mobile technology took over. And uh, that paradigm made it possible that Chinese and Indians became connected. And, and no one was not even able to dream about the idea that uh, year 2,700 million and year 2010, almost 7 billion people will be connected into the, into the international or global networks thanks to mobile technology. In that paradigm change, Europe was doing very well. That is quite often forgotten, but Europe was leading region in the world in that change. And it was not a coincidence. It was based on the fact that Europe was very well prepared for that. I know that because, because I, I was in the government of Finland when we, we, we made critical decisions, or in, in parliament and government of Finland when critical decisions were made. And also I, I saw that from, from Nokia's management team perspective. In 1990s, the best place in the world to create new mobile solutions and mobile technological tools was, was Europe. I, I left for Harvard University in the year 2000. I had in my pocket the, the, the most modern uh, device that was called Nokia's Communicator. That was actually the first smartphone ever. I took it with me, but I couldn't use that in the United States because the U.S., Telecommunication network was not sufficient for that. The paradigm the US had was slacking behind, and the European paradigm was working. And the European ecosystem was the best in the world, and that's the reason why we were leading in many sectors, in network business, in, in device business, uh, and, uh, and also operators in Europe were doing very well. But that paradigm didn't stay forever. Early 2000s, the whole system changed again because of the fact that software became dominant instead of hardware and digital content was integrated into the mobile devices and mobile systems. And America was able to provide the best environment for that. So the paradigm change that happened was able to be, to be used in the US environment, much better than, than the, the previous one, we, lo we won the first game, but unfortunately we lost the second one because Americans had better environment to do that. US ecosystem was better than ours. So, so this is my first message for you. Everything is about concept and context. If your context is changing, look at your concept carefully, change that in a way that you can meet the future requirements. It's very easy to be a political leader or business leader when there is a balance between your concept and context. You don't have to be, you don't have to have magic capacities to, to be good business leader or good politician when economy is growing and your model, business model works. Or in, in government, if, if economy is growing, tax revenues are coming in, it's not that difficult to distribute money that is flowing in. But as soon as this concept, your concept is not anymore in balance with the, with the environment, with the context, you are in deep troubles. And that has happened now in, in Europe and worldwide as well. Our concepts are based on, on more or less on, on industrial life and we are moving rapidly into a new world which is going to be characterized by, by two things, digital revolution and bio-revolution.
These are the two fundamental changes taking place in the world today. And both are happening. Europe can, Europe can do what, whatever it wants, want, but those two major changes are going to happen because there is a technological, technological trend behind those and there is, uh, there is uh, let's say, economic and, and, uh, and uh, uh, technological uh, necessity to, that things will, will happen. So I, I believe that uh, when looking at the future of Europe, Europe has to start to play the next game. We have, unfortunately, we lost this uh, present game in many respects. We have been lagging behind not only the United States, but, but China as well in many sectors. Um, and there is no way back. Uh, Mr. Trump is speaking about the idea that America will be great again. Uh, it's looking back. And it's never going to work. You have to look forward and you have to prepare yourself for the next game. You have to do, be, uh, act like a good player is acting. All right, ball is now there, but we have to look at where it is going to go. Um, and when looking at these two major changes, as I said, I, I can see a lot of changes to take place. Uh, but but uh, from technological perspective and, and economic perspective, these two dominant ones, uh, digitalization and uh, creation of bioeconomy, those are, those are areas where Europe has good assets. Europe has potential in, in, in both of these sectors. Uh, the question is how to take benefit from those resources, how to develop these resources in the best possible way in the, in the, in the future. Uh, and that's why I'd like to see the, the European leaders to speak about the digital single market, which is necessary for creating digital future for Europe, for Europe. and then maybe uh, to speak about uh, the European bioeconomy or, or European market for uh, bioeconomy. Because, because that market is not yet there. Market has to be created, exactly in the same way as we created uh, a right kind of market for, for mobile technologies in, in the 1990s. Many of you have read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's books, Goliath uh, and, uh, and uh, what else? But, but I, I was very much impressed uh, uh, his book titled Outliers. Uh, in that book, Malcolm Gladwell an analyzed why countries, governments, individual companies, regions, and even individuals, why they are successful. What are the factors behind successful performance uh, uh, in many uh, sectors? And he looked back to history, modern industrial history, and he made conclusions which I will put into five, five requirements uh, that has to be able to be met in order to, get, to, to become successful. For the first, he said, you need right timing. It's, uh, it's quite often uh, said that good business leaders are good leaders because they have special capacities. That is only partly true. I think timing is even more important. It's, so, it's not a coincidence that, that, uh, that many of the richest people in the world in the 19th century were born 19, in, in the, in the 19th, 1830s and 1840s. Why? Because railways came true and the breakthrough in the railway system took place uh, uh, in the middle of the uh, uh, 19th century and those people born just at that time had best potential to take benefit from that. And they were not, the best, most successful uh, uh, business leaders were not um, in railway business itself. Carnegie, Rockefeller, and many others. They were not railway, in, in railway business itself, but they had capacity to integrate railways into, in the case of Carnegie, into the steel industry, and in the case of uh, Rockefeller, into the uh, oil industry. And when looking at the potential of both digital technologies and, and, uh, and bio sector, I think we have a lot of uh, things to learn from those cases. 
because, because what made Carnegie big in the steel industry was that he was able to understand that, that steel business was old-fashioned. In that time, even, it was old-fashioned. He was able to integrate that, uh, that economy, old, actually old economy. He was able to integrate that into railway systems, but in the same time, he was able to integrate that into, into, uh, into uh, chemical industry and, and uh, uh, other technologies. So he was able to combine different, different uh, 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 sectors, technological sectors, into each other. And actually, uh, actually, Rockefeller did exactly the same. Oil industry that was started in Pennsylvania, he went there. He didn't understand anything about oil industry, but he understood that there is huge potential with this, and he was clever enough to integrate that into, into the railway system and, again, chemical industry and uh, other sectors, and made a, made, made a very fortunate business, business uh, structure. So, so the, the, the timing for that was perfect, because technological breakthrough had happened, uh, invention had uh, taken place, but applications were not yet there. And the same with uh, Steve Jobs or, or Bill Gates. It's, it's not poor coincidence that, that those guys became rich exactly uh, in the same time, or roughly in the same time. The reason is that when ICT revolution took place and when these revolutionary inventions were made, they, were, they had the right time to become industrial leaders in, 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 in that new context. So, Right timing, that is very important. Um, let's look at uh, timing for bioeconomy. Is, is the timing perfect now? Absolutely. If you look at Europe's uh, challenges, what we need in Europe? We need, uh, we need uh, sustainable solutions, yes. We have uh, agreed that we will reduce our, our uh, CO2 emissions uh, uh, by uh, 80% uh, by 2050. And we have two milestones by 2030, 40% reduction, uh, 2040, uh, 40, uh, 60% reduction, and then the ultimate goal, 80% uh, 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 reduction by 2050. It's, it's a huge, huge uh, objective, uh, uh, for, for, uh, ambitious objective for, for Europeans. But in order to succeed in that, bioeconomy has to be integrated into our policies. And that's why, like Mark said, this uh, update of our strategy is so critical, because that strategy has to be integrated in that, with, with that big picture. Uh, secondly, timing is correct because we need new jobs and new, new, new business opportunities. Europe needs new comparative advantages in, in the world economy. We cannot go back. We have to understand that we have lost certain comparative advantages in the global economy. We have to create new ones instead of those lost ones. And bioeconomy provides a lot of uh, opportunities. So, so timing is perfect. That first requirement of uh, Mr. Uh, Gladwell is there. Secondly, he said you need revolutionary technologies. In this sector, technological revolutions are, are needed. The present technologies are not sufficient enough to, to, to make that happen. We have to be able to... To, 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 to create new technologies, and especially we have to understand how to integrate different technologies into, to, together. I'm going to speak uh, about one uh, major uh, uh, investment in Finland. The biggest ever forest industry investment is going on just now in Finland. And it's not anymore called forest industry plant. It's called bio plant. And the idea is that they integrate different Technologi technological solutions together in a way that this plant is, is, uh, is uh, able to, to provide uh, uh, or, or to produce uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, forest industry products, but in the same time chemicals and energy, energy as, as well. And, and they don't know yet what the products are going to be, but they know that they have capacity to meet future uh, targets. For the third Gladwell says that in addition to, to right timing and revolutionary technology, you need risk-taking capacity. And that is difficult to be understood in Europe. Because we believe that future has to be predictable. We have to be able to guarantee for people that your life is secured. 
And if you want to make innovation, forget the idea that life will be secured. Because there is no innovation if you are not ready to accept risk. Risk uh, or innovation without risk is a mission impossible. There is no innovation which will be based on non-risk uh, option. No way. And I think this is very difficult to be understood in Europe. Most politicians in Europe, for example, they speak about innovation and they guarantee that we are in favor of innovation. But the second sentence after that is, we don't want to have any kind of risk. People have to live in non-zero risk environment. And there is a conflict with these two. So we have to accept risk in order to, to get things to be changed. For the fourth, uh, right kind of skills and talents. And if you look back at these paradigm shifts that have taken place in the world earlier, new sk skills and talents are very, very critical. And, uh, and I will speak about what kind of talents we, and skills we need in the future, but we have to understand that we cannot do this change with our present uh, educational systems and, uh, and uh, present capacities to create talents. And finally, uh, Gladwell says that you need the right kind of ecosystem. That is what I spoke already in the beginning. We were able to create a good ecosystem for mobile technology to grow. Now our challenge is to create the right kind of ecosystem for digital solutions to grow and the right kind of ecosystem for, for bioeconomy to, to be realized. So this is, this, is, this is the major challenge. And I think this Gladwell's checklist is very good when you start looking at bioeconomy opportunities. These five, five, five uh, points on the, on the agenda. But now I will, I, I will leave this timing because I think you agree that timing is perfect. I don't have to, I have to show to you why it is so important. I, I, I think we, we, we can agree easily that timing is perfect for, for, for bio, bioeconomy to come. But uh, then everything else on Gladwell's list, I will put under the title ecosystem. Because also this risk-taking capacity, skills and talents uh, can be easily integrated into that ecosystem requirement. And, and uh, the rest of my, my speech I'm, I'm going to spend for, for, for this topic. How to create the best ecosystem in the world for bioeconomy in Europe. That is, that is what we, we have to be able to do. Um, first, uh, technological development. We have to be able to invest in new technologies. R&D spending is critical in this sector. And we have to be able to do that together. Uh, you referred to my uh, work with the European Commission. We produced their so-called AHO report. And the fundamental idea in this report was that Europe is lacking behind in R&D spending and we have to be able to, to, to achieve the 3% the level we, we committed uh, in Barcelona uh, 2002. We are still far away from that. We are still far away from that. Uh, uh, Ten years time when Lisbon strategy was adopted year 2000 uh, and the target was that by 2010 we are going to be the best place in the world to, to have business the best, uh, most competitive region in the world, almost nothing happened. To be honest, we couldn't reach any of these ambitious goals. And one of the go fundamental goals that was not achieved was the target set for R&D spending. Money is not uh, the only thing. Money is a uh, uh, necessary resource, but we have to be able to collaborate and we have to be able to understand that we have to to integrate our resources in, in Europe. And that is, I think, a very important message for you. Northern Europe and Southern Europe have to work together and we have to be able to share this technological, uh, uh, technological R&D uh, plan in a way that everyone is able to contribute and, and learn from each other. Because when working together, we can get much more out of our uh, limited resources. Then we need also European platforms because, because in this change, small and medium-sized companies can play a big role. I will re return back to this Anikoski bio factory. The idea is to have a huge factory. It's a huge investment. 10% of uh, the Finnish uh, raw material will be used in that one single entity. 
but there is going to be a huge number of companies that are operating uh, on, the, on the plant. Some of them in chemical sector, some of them finding uh, solutions that are not yet there. So I, I think we have to be able to create that kind of platforms for bioeconomy to grow. The same challenge in the, in the digital area as, as well. Then the second point, talents and skills. How to create talent and skills? Uh, we discussed with Mark yesterday that there is not any master program uh, at uh, a European uh, university for bioeconomy. Not a single one. So we speak about bioeconomy, but we are not training people to, to meet those challenges coming from that. We have a lot of specialists in many of these sectors, but we have to be able to integrate these sectors in a way that we will have the right kind of skills and talents. Future is multifunctional. Both digitalization and bioeconomy challenges are going to require a huge amount of uh, multidisciplinary skills and talents. And, uh, and I think we have to be able to move fast to get that kind of educational reform to take, take place. And again, I think it's a European challenge. We have to be able to work together. It's not enough that one single country or a couple of countries are doing that. We have to have European-wide educational effort on all levels, but especially on the, on the university level, to take, take place. Uh, then... Uh, about risk-taking capacity. I think venture funding is, is going to be needed in this sector as well. Traditionally, biosector has been dominated by rather big players, big companies. But now, as I said, they are going to be, they are going to be clusters where there are big players, yes, and they are necessary, necessary uh, in this sector. But we are going to have more and more small and medium-sized companies integrated into, into this business. And in order to get them to be involved, we have to have a financial system, a financing system, which is going to support high risk takers. Because our traditional banking system is not designed for high risk taking. Because when you innovate, when you, when you create a traditional industrial investment, banking system is very capable to finance that. Because you know that when investment is made, made there is going to be a certain amount of return and the risk is rather limited and, and banking sector capacity is fine with that. But if you want to make breakthroughs and, and innovation, real innovations, the risk is from zero to, to sky. And, uh, and if you are doing only that kind of investments which are going to guarantee that you will get your money back, forget the whole business. Uh, there are many sectors, uh, uh, new sectors where Maybe 30% of, uh, uh, of uh, companies will succeed. Even 10% can be good in many, many, many sectors. So we have to accept that there, are, there is going to be a lot of failures. And that is a very important lesson for policymakers in, in Europe. If, if you want to get bioeconomy to grow, you have to understand that there is going to be a lot of cases which are going to be failures. But failure doesn't mean that uh, investment has been wrong because we can learn from those failures. We can, we can understand to what direction we have to go. So if, if you go and you move to high risk area or innovative area, you have to understand this risk taking. Risk -taking. It means that high risk and high reward. Low risk, low, low reward, very simple. And that's why we need high risk financial me mechanisms and they are venture funding mechanisms. And I hope that uh, also these big players in this business are going to create their own tools for that. Because that has happened in many sectors, that big players have their own venture, venture, uh, uh, venture uh, entities. I'm not sure if uh, big uh, uh, forest, traditional forest industry companies do have that much venture funding entities. I don't think that it's, uh, they, are, they are exceptions. I think they need them and, and this is necessary. Then one uh, issue that was also mentioned in our report year 2006, public procurement policies. Roughly 16 to 70 percent of uh, GDP in the European Union is spent for public procurement. How is it spent? Today, in most cases, we are buying 
the, poor, the cheapest alternative in the market. That means traditional products and services that include very little, if any, innovation. And public procurement policies have to be redesigned in a way that they can include risk-taking as well, and, uh, and in that way they will promote uh, in innovation. That has been discussed in Europe a lot since 2006, but unfortunately the system is, is still what it has been, and it has to be changed. And the bioeconomy needs that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, opportunity as well, because many of these, uh, many of these uh, applications and solutions are closely linked to, to public sector. So public sector procurement policies can promote creation of, of um, bioeconomy in a massive way. Then fourth element in this ecosystem is regulatory environment. If you ask me why Europe became dominant, what was the one single decision made in Europe in 1980s and 1990s that made Europe the most successful mobile sector uh, ecosystem in the world? It's easy to answer. It was GSM standard that was adopted in Copenhagen 90, uh, 1987. That standard made it possible that Europe was having common, common standard on the basis of which everyone was starting to work. And uh, the United States did not have that kind of capacity and they were lagging behind because of, because of that. So if we need, as I said, the digital single market, we need also for, for, for the European biomarket, biomarket with certain amount of common rules, certain amount of common standardization, so that everyone knows that if I go to this direction, if I take my risk into that direction, it means that others are doing roughly, roughly the same. Because together we can, we can make the change. Then <clears throat> the fifth element uh, in, in this ecosystem is business and government collaboration. And, uh, and I'm going to conclude with this because I believe that this is one of those major assets we have in Europe. We are not taking benefit from that, but if you look at the United States, government is, is weak, as we have seen. Companies are strong, but government is weak. There is imbalance between these two. And... Uh, Business and government collaboration is, is not what it should and it could be uh, because, of, uh, because of the fact that companies don't fully understand that the need for government and government has limited resources to do what is necessary for the, for the future. And why it is working so well, the US system now? Because of the fact that, that, uh, that digital revolution that is going to take place and that is driving the US economy now uh, in a massive way, that is based on rather simple applications, more or less entertainment-driven business, uh, business solutions. And it's easy to do that kind of solutions without business and government collaboration, because, because they are rather simple. But when you move to higher added value solutions, that collaboration requirement is going to increase. And the same with bio sector as well. If you do simple solutions, simple easy solutions, business can do that on their own resources. Government is not that much needed. But if you, if you raise the bar, you want to make complicated uh, uh, solutions, like Anikoski Factory. Anikoski Factory is a huge business and government collaboration uh, issue in Finland. Because that kind of huge business uh, investment cannot be executed without having government involved. And, and, uh, and one reason why it works so well and why construction goes so well is the fact that that, that collaboration is, is, is there. So I, I think we, we have to understand that we have capacities compared to the United States. And if you look at the, the east, to the east, China, in China, government is strong, dominant, like it is in many Asian countries. Companies are, yes, they are strong, but they are always, they are, they, they, there is imbalance between especially between private business and, and government. And, and that's why this is an area where, where Europe really can make a difference, if we can collaborate in a, in a new way. But that means that government is not on the execution side. 
we have to be able to understand that we need the best business resources, the best talents and skills and capacities of the private sector in order to get things to happen, both in digital revolution, in the digital revolution, and in creation of bio, bio revolution as, as well. We, we have to be able to integrate them into this. But governments have a role, necessary, uh, indispensable role in creating architecture for this. Quite often when people speak about, because, uh, about architecture, they ask me, what do you mean with architecture? I mean architecture. If you want to construct a house, what are you doing? You don't go to, to the bank first, or you don't go to plumber, or, or you don't go to, to workers uh, to ask them to come. And you don't bring all the, all the tools, uh, materials, and devices on the site and start constructing a house. No. <coughs> first person you call is architect. Because you need architecture in order to put things into the right place. And then everyone is able to contribute in the a, in a right way. And exactly this is needed in the biosector as well. We need a good architecture. And to be honest, the European Union is not doing at, at all well with that. They don't have this kind of architecture. And many countries, individual countries, have uh, difficulties. Even most successful uh, uh, countries with biosector, I think they have challenges, huge challenges with, with architecture. How to design the future society in a way that we can take maximum benefit from biosector. It's easier to understand this requirement in the digital area, uh, on the digital side because digital, digital applications are requiring uh, changes. But, but bio is similar. In order to get bio sector to grow and uh, bio innovation to take place, I think we need sufficient, uh, sufficient, uh, uh, sufficient uh, um, uh, uh, ecosystem, ecosystem and, and, uh, and architecture for that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this was my message. Uh, uh, this was rather general, but, but I hope that this can create some kind of contextual environment for your, for your discussions today. Um, uh, you know that last night or yesterday, uh, Shimon Peres passed away. He, he was a very, very famous Israeli politician. I met him uh, three weeks ago in, in Villa d'Este uh, or, or uh, Chernobyl in Italy. He was attending one, one conference there. And uh, he, was, uh, he was 94 when he, he now passed away. And, uh, and, and the organizer of that event asked him uh, a few years ago when he was uh, there, he was annually in this same seminar or conference, uh, and he asked uh, Mr. Perez, how come you are, you are so dynamic and how come in, the, in spite of your high age, you are so active and dynamic. And you, even even this year, he spoke about the future and how 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 in technology and society can play a big role in the, in creating uh, the future. Um, and and the, his answer was very very nice. Mr. Perez said, "A person is young as long as he has more dreams than memories." And I think he, this is the challenge for Europe as well. Quite often when we speak about the capacities of Europe and, and the future of Europe, we start looking back how Europe was strong doing that and that and how we have been able to keep peace uh, since the Second World War and uh, how we have been able to create a social model and uh, how we are better than others in that and that and that. But they are memories. It's time to move to the future, <laughs> the dreams uh, that, that Europe urgently, urgently needs. That's why I think this bio-sector uh, agenda is so critical for, for, for Europe in, in the future. Thank you.